Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Kara DeForn of You Relish Farm to talk about her experience with dehydrating the urban farm. Kara is passionate about the tradition of supper and takes Civil War history very seriously. So it made sense for her to couple her food passion with membership in Mid-States Living History Association. In the tradition of Dutch oven cooking during the Civil War, a supper was served at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and a good, plain, and substantial meal with nothing fanciful according to Godey's Magazine, dated 1863. As a living historian and owner of You Relish Farm, Kara enjoys guiding others on low-cost ways to store their urban farm harvest and offers secrets from the apothecara. Welcome to the show today, Kara. Thanks for having me, Greg. We're excited to speak with you today. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Ten years ago, I became an active living historian representing the time period of 1863 to 1865. Indiana had one... Raid. We didn't have any battles during uh-huh. the Civil War, but we did have a very significant raid. Mm-hmm. And through study uh, at the public library uh-huh. and at the university library, I was able to take daily journals and read them and integrate dehydrating into um, my purpose as a living historian. Mm-hmm. What? Say more about that. What is a living historian? That sounds fascinating. A living historian spends time both through the record keeping of places like the Indiana State Archives, Mm -hmm. they research a persona, and then they activate by performing within contextual settings and past time periods. Uh Imagine being at Connor Prairie for Civil War days or at the Ramage Museum in Kentucky, where you're actually on a site that proliferates the opportunity to have people engage uh, about a specific time period. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's cool. And how long have you been doing this? You said 10 years. 10 years, mm-hmm. a decade. Wow, all right, so I have to know something. There's, yes, there's one or two points of time since in the past 10 years that something just amazing happened in this realm of what you're talking about. Is there not? Yes. Can you speak of one of them? Tell us about one of them. Well, the 150th anniversary just happened. And so for me, 
it was really about communicating the time period of 1863 and specifically a hot July 23rd day uh-huh. when in when General John Hunt Morgan came across the Ohio River uh-huh. and decided he was looking for butternuts. Butternuts are, were snaky southern sympathizers or confederates. Oh, right. He was hungry, and he was on horseback with 150 men, and he came across the Ohio River in search of food, even though he was going against the orders of General Bragg, who was fighting in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He he came across the Ohio line anyway, Uh even though the Confederate generals dissuaded him to go into Indiana for fear that they would find the Hoosier National Guard, Mm. led at that time by General Lew Wallace, under the direction of Governor Morton. And he came into town, and he didn't find any butternuts. What he found was the citizens, our capital city at that time was Corridon, it Uh now is Indianapolis. Uh And he had to travel north. And he came upon, in the middle of the night, a small town of Vive, Indiana, where he took residence from a woman and her eight children. He loaded the woman into the cart and deposited her children five miles away so that they had time to steal the green apples of summer Uh and 3,000 pigs. Oh, my God. General John John Hunt Morgan was quite greedy, gluttonous. Uh Uh-huh. If you can imagine. Well, we drove him out, and we found him because of the pig parts that had been left behind oh, yeah. on the fields. We captured him in Ohio, and we scrubbed him down with a horse brush, shaved his face, and then the lady of the house got to call him a sissy. <laughs> a sissy. Well, there you go. Interesting. And so that was a, uh, something you performed somewhere? many locations Uh, it's really been a personal mission to bring forward the lady of charity uh this would have been a woman who was not paid uh, for services rendered Uh women like anna plunk who was given an honorary lieutenancy by general lou wallace for her work as a spy for the union forces without women um, perhaps the union would have not won the war because of the work they did. We were paid for being nurses, uh-huh. cooks, and laundresses, uh-huh. about two cents a day in 1863. Uh-huh. But women who provided information, espionage, or materials such as preserves, conserves, uh-huh. or more practical permaculture in the form of a mussy tussy or a posy to the men on the battlefield, uh-huh. we would, she would have provided those at no cost and at great danger and risk to herself. Right. Interesting. Interesting. So you've, you've learned a lot about this over the past decade. Yes, I've spent the, my free time both reading, studying, interpreting, uh-huh. I am motivated to do this because often children aren't given enough information yeah. about the Civil War and what no. happened on our own soil. Yeah. So when a parent leans over to me and asks me when the, did this happen or who won, what was the result of the war, I know there's more work to do. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. 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 Let's talk about food. Um, Yeah. So I have a, my, my first question for you is a very curious one. And it is, what is laundry room wild crafting? Women of 1863 did both cooking as well as laundry and dye work all in the same hearth. Uh-huh. And I want our contemporary keepers of the hearth to realize that we have more square footage than the women of 1863 uh-huh. and more resources. And that it's okay to spread out into the laundry room, which now is a separate entity. Oh, yes. 
that we can create a sanitary environment to dehydrate right in our laundry rooms with gear that we already have. Wow. So in, interestingly enough, that's where my dehydrator lives is in the laundry room. So I, I'm doing good. So w you said with gear that we already have. Tell me more yeah. about that. We already have cooking racks. Oh, yes. Or cooling racks. Mm -hmm. We might put cakes or pies or cookies on these type of racks. Mm -hmm. We already have mesh baskets to keep our tools and our gear. Mm -hmm. We already have a dryer machine that can be used as a clean and sanitary surface. And we already have gear like the laundry drying rack that we might throw wet socks over. Uh -huh. We can use all of these gear or tools that we already own to create space for laundry room wild crafting. Okay, say more about that. Laundry room wild crafting is a concept that we can use our gear uh -huh. that allows us to hang dry to dry petals for uh -huh. tea or to uh -huh. Yeah, perfect. We can use the surface of our dryer as a place to use cooling racks. The main principle behind dehydrating is that we must allow airflow to pass through oh, yes. and to, not, to prevent mold. Mm -hmm. So we can create hooks on our ceiling to do lines of drying as they would have in 1863. Interesting. Cool. So what method of dehydrating is the most cost effective? Laundry room dryer rack drying. Wow. So our, our dryer already emits heat. Right. And we are expending energy and resources. Women of 1863 would have had to use a fireplace, which is right. far more unpredictable than the top of our drying yep. machine. Yeah. They would have strung beans over the hearth, and that's how we get the terms, the stringed bean. Oh, <laughs> nice. So if we use the top of our dryer machine after we've cleaned it mm -hmm. successfully... We can use our already got the gear cooling racks yep. to use as a clean drying surface. This doesn't work for every piece of permaculture, uh -huh. but it would work for delicates like basil. Perfect. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you for a moment. You just used the word permaculture in a context that I don't understand. Can you kind of explain that to me so we can go back and visit that? Sure. Permaculture to me is a ecosystem that is thriving with different layers of a food forest. Right. Permaculture to me is also based and rooted in the woman's garden. It would have been used to heal the sick and the wounded. Yeah, perfect. It would have also been used to rid... Uh, the smell of the odiferous, rancorous odors of the hospital. Uh -huh. So a lady of charity would strap a permaculture posy, uh, items that were already found in her front or backyard. Got it. Okay, good. On, onto her wrist for multiple uses. She would have made a tisan in Indiana because we don't grow tea. Uh-huh. She would have kept it close to her nose. She would have used lamb's ear for bandages when cotton was inaccessible. Uh -huh. She would have brought the bay leaf that was in her posy to aid to the arrowroot broth that she fed the men or the pace. Uh -huh. She would have brought yarrow to the battlefield in order to steep the lacerations and wounds. She would have created beautiful. Them poultices to uh, oh, yeah. lower inflammation. Yep. Yeah. Wow, cool. All from nature. Gotta love that. Yeah. It's a use what you got. It is That's definitely fun. a use what you got. So what are some other low-cost dehydration methods? 
I love to use a folding drying rack. Can you en- envision a collapsible structure that yeah. grandma would have had or perhaps that you have to put delicates over? Right. The ones that... Sometimes they're flat surface, but right. I prefer the ones that are vertical like I do in my garden mm-hmm. or room. Right, exactly. So we can use the upwards or vertical drying rack just as we can a flat surface. Mm-hmm. But in this case, we can use more hardy herbs. I hang mint very effectively. I hang sage very effectively. Mm-hmm. Thyme is a hardier yep. and more available herb. And savory does well. Not the flavor, but the actual herb. Oh, right. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful, and th- and these are so dehydrating a, a mango or an apple or um, up where you're at pawpaws. Is that what what method would you use to dehydrate something with a little bit more uh, uh, texture to it? A very low cost way is to use the heat of the summer. Oh, yes. Uh, Apples are a little bit more challenging and really require a low-cost dehydrator Mm -hmm. because of the moisture content. Right. So for me, that's at about a 95-degree temperature, and we must realize that the dehydrator can vary about 20 degrees Mm -hmm. to the lower for the actual food product. Mm -hmm. And and as a serve-safe kitchen manager those high moisture content vegetables are not the most ideal uh, in a cooling rack or a hang method. That those should be in the dehydrator in the laundry room, like you stated earlier, that those items have too much moisture content. Women of 1863 would have hung them by the fire. So just as we strung the beans, we would have also strung the apple rings um, Mm -hmm. for later processing. If it's still a a warm September day, that means 90 degrees are over. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then then we have options like solar ovens today or outdoor dehydrators. Got it. Cool. Cool. And, And what about seeds? How do you prepare seeds for dry storage? I'm a big believer in doing something every Sunday, whether it's saving seed Sunday or sowing seed Sunday. Nice. For consistency. Yeah. And so right now we're doing a lot of saving seed. Um, I like to dry those on a wire mesh tool bin. Uh-huh. Uh, you can find those. Uh, even in the plastic format, you probably already have that gear in your drawer that you can use. Uh-huh. So I'm working right now with bok choy pods, uh, kale pods oh, yes. that we will yep. save. Yep. They're the tiniest of seeds. Oh, yes, and they are, so, aren't they? <laughs> yes. You can lose them very easily. So I like to put the pod um, into a glass jar after it's been dried in the laundry room. Mm-hmm. And then I keep the pod in the interior of a mason jar as I seed strip it from the pod. Mm. I don't keep the pods through the winter um, for fear that they have some moisture content. Right. And then I finish them by putting them in a cool, dry environment. To me, that's a refrigerator. You know, the extra refrigerator in the garage, an extra refrigerator in the laundry room, if you're so lucky. Mm -hmm. But I do keep mine in a refrigerated status. So interesting you should say uh, extra refrigerator in the laundry room. I actually have an extra uh, uh, stand-up freezer, and one of the things that I notice on the top of that is that it gets very hot. I'll bet you I could dehydrate things there, couldn't I? Yes, a flat surface. Yeah. That's pretty much... If you have height above it, you could use a hanging uh, folding clothes rack that's collapsible for temporary storage. Yeah. And that's the one that that hangs and it's got a zipper around it and it's got uh, like a tool around it, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Oh man, you're giving me so many great ideas to go play with. Good. 
So can you describe the process of creating a tisane or herbal infusion? And what's it yes. for? Uh, tisans, tisanes. I, I read uh, in this time period of 1863 mm-hmm. to 1865 was a main way to provide uh, sustenance nutrient density Mm. on people who were either failing or needed to be rehydrated. Right. Uh, In Indiana, we can grow a northern hibiscus. Mm. Hibiscus was used as a rehydrator. Uh Uh-huh. And so it was often um, slipped under the tongue to help people rehydrate. Oh, interesting. Uh, Tizanes can also be used uh, as a as a brewing method, uh-huh. linen was scarce, so often they would take um, herbs directly into a boiling pot of water and then just strain them off. Oh, right. And again, for nutrients to be provided, mm-hmm. or in the form of a poultice. So an herbal infusion would be a blend of herbs. In my case, that is nettle, which is an amazing oh, yes. culture plant. Yep. Two grams of protein, iron, antihistamines. It can be applied topically. It can be uh, consumed. Mm -hmm. And I also combine that with a variety of mints. I think one of the easiest plants to grow is mints, a Mm -hmm. variety, to add flavor as well as um, a calming digestive effect. Wow. Wow. How cool is that? So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you learned from it. I was performing on a really rainy day in the summer, mm-hmm. and I'm wearing a 11 yards of fabric. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and a hoop skirt 130 inches in diameter. Oh, my gosh. And we were in a public, we were in a field, Uh and a thunderstorm was coming in. And I, because we were the only tent, we had a hospital tent with shelter, the public sought shelter in the tent. Uh Wet and dreary and with the storm encroaching, I thought that failure was (laughs) upon me. And once we sat down on the hospital cots and just settled in to brace the storm, uh, it reminded me of William B. Cushing, a lieutenant on the Union forces. Uh And he decided that at the dark of night, he would hop aboard a Confederate ironclad. And he swam upriver to meet the Confederate ironclad by himself. Mm -hmm. And he hopped aboard the ironclad, which is an old-time submarine. And he fought bravely with sword and pistol in the dark of the night. And he ultimately fell off the boat and had to swim upstream three miles. Mm Mm-hmm. And it gave me perspective as I told this story to 50 people in the Mm -hmm. tent, huddled in the cold, Mm -hmm. that even though you're dreary and wet and your posy has been decimated, (laughs) (laughs) that through story and through uh, thoughtful consideration of history, Mm -hmm. we can get through some of the worst of times. Beautiful. Beautiful. So what do you consider your biggest success? I have been on this purpose or mission of providing uh, a alternative for slow cooking Mm -hmm. and to maximize people's dollars by using the slow cooking method, bringing in their own food and doing your own load of growing food sustainably that's nutrient dense. I've been on a mission to uh, address obesity. Ah, yes. And because of my background from 
IU School of Medicine and my time with the IU Foundation, it became important for me to use slow food cooking integrated with uh, food, not lawns, Uh to um, help address sustainability within my community. So a young boy, this was my first year when nothing sells and you wonder if you've lost your mind for creating a company. Uh And he came to my booth and he said, I love your pizza lentils more than my video game and my family eats dinner together. Hmm. And it was because that I had dried the oregano and dried the basil and dried the marjoram and made it fresh uh, that I believe his family was eating together. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. So a couple of times uh, during our last five minutes or so, you talked about slow cooking. Mm -hmm. And when we haven't touched on that yet, can you give me a couple minutes on what do you mean by that? What is that? During the time period of 1863 to 1865, Uh this would have been Dutch oven cooking. Uh It would have been buried under embers. Oh. In 1971, a man invented uh, the beanery. That's what he called it. He meant it to cook beans efficiently so Uh that we didn't have to work under the fires and the embers and toil outside in a kitchen hearth. Mm-hmm. So in the 70s, we became, it became known as the crock pot. It was purchased by Rival. Ah. And as I was working for Dean Mark Sothman at the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, a piece of data came across my desk that said, people who slow cook won't go through the drive through line 98% of the time. <laughs> Nice. And that was really compelling data to me. Yeah. So compelling that I began to package supper in a sack. <laughs> uh, nice. From a permaculture sustainability standpoint. What yeah. could I grow? Right. To go in these sacks. And how? How can it be a whole meal? Mm -hmm. And how can it be sustainable? And and how can we listen to the earth and put ingredients in it that that eight-year-old might want? Right, exactly. So that is why I'm so passionate about slow cooking as a methodology. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So what drives you? The research drives me. I spend time in Godey's Magazine, which is like the woman's home journal of the day, uh-huh. in integrating with my other cast members, venues. Uh, I'll never forget when Larry Parlberg at the Lou Wallace Museum and Study introduced me to a woman named Anna Plunk. Uh-huh. And Anna was a mother of 11 Oh my Two gosh. of her boys were in uh, General Lou Wallace's brigade. Uh-huh. And Anna was uh, compelled to inform General Lou Wallace about the bur- burned bridges and the crop loss and the movements of the Confederate church. Mm-hmm. And so for me, those stories just become so meaningful, especially when Anna talks about the herbs and her posy, and you realize that you can grow mallow. That's not something that isn't available to right, us in right. 2016. That I can successfully in Zone 6A grow lavender, which she would have used, and comfrey and white and yellow yarrow. Uh-huh. And so for me, the research drives my planting. Nice. Nice. So I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there one book that has been significantly influential for you in this process? 
I am very interested in root cellaring. So oh. even though conceptually we don't have many people have root cellars anymore, right. uh, I think it harkens back to a time when refrigeration was unavailable mm -hmm. and yet they were able to keep their crops through the winter. Now yeah. that could be as simple as leaving the leaks in All right. the ground yep. yeah, yeah. To, to actually dredging out the earth. Mm -hmm. So is there a book around that? Yes, it's called Root Cellaring. Root Cellaring, okay, who's it yes. by? Cool. Mike and Nancy Babel, called and root it's just called Root Cellaring, Natural Cold Storage and of Fruits and Vegetables. Nice. They're more difficult to dehydrate, Greg, so if I can find a non-refrigeratable method, yeah. uh, this is having the most impact on my, my growing. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been wanting to put a root cellar in here at the urban farm for a couple of decades. I just don't have the dirt for it. I don't have the space, you know. The land. Yeah, exactly. Just on a personal note, like uh -huh. you don't even have room to bury a refrigerator, an old, unfunctioning refrigerator. Well, now that's an interesting thought. Just a concept. Yeah. Because that's one of the things that Nancy or Mike and Nancy Babel uh -huh. are suggesting as a low cost method to root celery. Mm -hmm. that we don't we just have to bury a we just have to bury a non functioning refrigerator. Interesting. Well it makes perfect sense because eighteen inches two feet down it's sixty eight degrees. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Persistence pays. Mm -hmm. That once you get bored of something, look at it in a different way. <laughs> if you don't like, if you don't like someone, ask them more questions. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Kara. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Thank you, Greg. It's been a privilege. So, how can our listeners get a hold of you? We write a blog mm -hmm. uh, on you, which is the letter u hyphen relish dot com. Okay, and they can you can find me there. Perfect, and we'll have that link on the show notes page. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Thanks, Greg. You bet. Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.